welcome class. We are now on chapter nine. We are in May and it, today is May 4th. May the 4th be with you. All right. Um, so this obviously will be posted on the 5th, so it takes hours for it to upload, but I thought I would celebrate. And for those of you fellow nerds, that was for you. Um, okay, so uh, we are going to cover chapter nine. Um, real quick, actually, those of you have responded um, to my email about are you in? Yes, it looks fantastic. Every email I kept getting with exclamation point, I'm in, I'm in. I felt like we were rallying. Like I was very excited about this. So uh, thank you all uh, for that. Again, forgive me if I'm not getting right back to you. Um, I, I am getting the emails. Um, if you mentioned, hey, can you upload or unload this? If it's for your response five, for any of those of you going, I didn't get credit for response five, don't panic. I do have those on a list. Uh, getting in and grading is a big pain. So it's just taking me a little bit longer than I'd like, uh, but don't worry. If you did the I'm in and you've been turning in your work, uh, even if you're a little behind, don't worry. Um, you guys are doing great. So thank you. I know things have been rough and wild and weird and we'll see. Um, I hear businesses will be opening on Friday through California. So maybe that'll be a little bit more normalcy. I'm sure we'll have to wear masks and all that good stuff, but you know what? One step forward is better than however many back. So uh, let's get forward, uh, get going as we move forward here on uh, chapter nine. Uh, vocabulary words, we do have a lot, but these are common words you probably use all the time, not anything that's too uh, unreal or something you haven't heard of. Um, so uh, ethnocentrism, uh, fair-mindedness, egocentrism, defense mechanisms, rationalization, cognitive dissonance, denial, conformity, groupthink, emotional reasoning, mind reading, filtering, personalizing, and active listening. So there you go. Uh, again, go ahead and if you're with me, follow on the PowerPoint because this particular uh, PowerPoint, I'm going to ask you to pause this video and go watch the videos that are on the PowerPoint. Um, they will follow through as we keep going. You'll see when you watch them. Uh, one of them is an oatmeal video. I absolutely love it. It's, it's something that I think, especially right now with what we got going on, incredibly helpful. Okay, I've had a lot of coffee, so let's get to it. Um, what I want you to kind of start off with first, and that first slide after our vocabulary words, are questions I want you to ask yourself. I want you to kind of say it out loud if you need to stop me. Okay, and then ask, that's okay too. Um, so some opening questions are, what is fair-mindedness? What is your definition of fair-mindedness, aside from the book, um, in your opinion? Um, how are critical thinking and fair-mindedness uh, fair related? How are they related to one another? Why is being open to fair-mindedness fair more important now than ever? Okay, um, what is the difference between an individual perspective in a group perspective. And this is very important to kind of understand, especially as you move forward in life, you know, your individual perspective on how you see things and the group perspective. Um, sometimes it correlates, sometimes they don't, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. And we're gonna go forward and see what that means. Um, so what are some examples of things that we see uh, from an individual perspective? So our own health, our own success, our desire for things, um, that sort of thing. What are some examples of things that we see from an individual perspective? Things about who we are and ourselves. Who makes the decision about these things? Now you'd think it was you, right? In a sense, yes, but notice society has a huge part in that too. Think of all the ways and reasons in which you make a decision. What's behind that? Is it truly your own thing or is there something that's persuading you and everything we've read before actually has to do with that too okay uh, what are some of the groups we identify with um, from smaller groups to larger groups um, that could be anything like a small group of people who all like playing the ukulele I love playing the ukulele you know that kind of small like you know like-minded group uh, versus uh, a bigger group as you get bigger and bigger um, you could lean into, you know, political views, whether you're a conservative or liberal or right in the middle, humanist. Why is there not a humanist? There should be a humanist one. Anyway, um, all these different ways in which you might find a larger group that you identify with. 
uh, versus a smaller group. Um, just kind of think about that. When we are making decisions and viewing the world, viewing the world, okay, dealing with others, that's another big one, as we view the world, we're dealing with others. Do we tend to see things from our own perspective at first or from a group perspective? Are you viewing it from what you know ways to be? Remember we talk about assumption value, our, our personal values, our assumptions. Uh, versus the way the group sees things, the groups that you identify with. Do you always agree with that? All right. So we talk about babies have nothing but their own perspective. Think about a baby. Look at a baby and go, what are you thinking? It's not thinking about you. It's thinking about itself. It, it only knows what it sees within itself. So then the question to ask is, when do we start developing outside perspective? Some of you actually might know this scientific answer because you work in child development. I actually don't know. I should have researched this before doing this. I totally didn't think about it. Um, but at what point do we start developing an outside perspective? And then if you want to take it a little step further beyond just what we see others like, oh, sharing. I now see there's another, another baby here with me. Here's my other toy. We share. There's a perspective versus all of a sudden changing to go, how do I say this? Developing not just seeing another person, but then again, kind of honing into what you is purely only your thoughts. So sorry, let me go to the next slide and it'll make more sense. So think of some issues that you've dealt with from a group perspective. Okay, so deciding where to live, um, how to pay for a road trip, bond measures, bond measures, you know, you like, you know, vote on those. Uh, whether pot should be legal in this state and etc. So chief among these is sheltering place <laughs> for the virus, right? That's actually a group perspective right now because despite our individual thoughts on how this should be, we go out and say for the betterment of the whole, for those who might have immune system issues, the elderly, we're going to be considerate and say, you know what, we're going to shelter in place until we can figure this out because this is just something new to us. Um, that would be a group decision or even the group decision to go out and protest the fact that we have to do the shelter in place. So these are group decisions. Who tends to make these decisions, these group decisions? Sometimes it could be one person. Sometimes it could be um, a small individual like who I just am. I'm not like a person, um, but we could do maybe a, you know, a politician or a leader or a business or something along those lines. Who's tending to make these decisions? And the question to ask you is, are you decisive or amenable? Uh, meaning, do you just go with what others decide? Mindlessly go, ah, that's what they're doing, I'm gonna do it too. Or um, do you make a decision based on critical thinking, understanding what the next right step might be based on your research, okay? And does the size of the group determine how decisive or amenable you are? Okay, does the size of the group determine it? Meaning, do you need, you know, a huge group of protesters or just a handful of you to make that decision on whether or not you want to storm um, the Capitol? Okay, or not, or stay home. Maybe you're only the handful who stay home versus those who want to go out. All right, does that group, does the size change how you feel about it? So there are some issues and problems in our society that absolutely must be dealt with from a group perspective. The virus obviously is one of them. Climate change is another. That's a very big one. As a group, we have to decide what is our next best step to save us from ourselves, right? That's a huge one. Um, the ocean fish population is another one. Um, it's currently at a critical level. We are absolutely overfishing the oceans. The oceans, like that's, that has to say a lot that how big the oceans are and yet they're at a critical level of lack of fish. Um, so one would be, should Indonesia trawlers with drift nets, you guys ever see the drift nets where they pull it, uh, be operative five miles off our coast? Indonesia trawlers five miles off our coast. Does that make sense? Like how far of a distance Indonesia is through where we're at? All right, so immigration across the world is something that you have to make a big group decision about. Um, approaches to contagious diseases, uh, Actually, uh, coronavirus is a virus, not a disease. Anyway, I'll fix that later. Um, a disease, uh, virus like coronavirus. Um, that's something that we have to kind of decide as a group how we're going to handle this for the better of all. 
Uh, the Ganges River, one of the largest in the world, it flows through several countries. And what happens upstream, as you know, affects everybody downstream. One of the links I was talking about previously is actually right here, the map of the Ganges. It's from BBC. Click on that and scroll through. I think it's really important to take a look at that and understand why that's something that we bring up here. And what other examples can you think of? What's something that for you, you could say it requires a group perspective? Um, the question might be, can one person make the decisions about these things? Can one person make the decisions about these things? And that's, that's hard to say because not everyone has the same agreement with just one person. Okay, so this is something for you to kind of consider when we listen to one person who might have, you know, a certain amount of authority and we listen to just what they say, but we don't consider what other people might be saying or what research is saying, okay? Uh, do we have individual opinions about these things? Do we have individual opinions about these things? Of course we do. All right, so let's talk about ethnocentrism. Ethros, ethnocentrism. It's the belief that one's own culture is superior uh, or more important than others, okay? Some people view the U.S. as a superior country to others. And why is this? Um, is it the propaganda in the media? Is it that it's saying that that's the case? Is it something that we are taught in school? Um, pride, patriotism, okay? And then actual good things about our country. Are these the things that you that one might consider the U.S. as being superior? And do other countries feel the same way about their country? Are there other countries who participate in ethnocentrism and believe that their country is superior? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are some dangers of this belief that the U.S. is superior? What are some dangers that you might consider in us making these statements? Um, Maybe some issues with that is that there's an unfair treatment of those in other countries. So uh, those of other countries, unfortunately, get not the best treatment because the U.S. considers itself superior and said dominates. Um, the U.S. actually uses 60% of the world's resources and we're hoarding them. Think about it. The U.S. is using 60% of the world's resources. That's a wild statement right there, okay? Uh, we have military domination. Uh, we outsource our pollution to China, right, and to Mexico. So we don't actually make it in America. We send it out, and that's also dominating those countries. Do you guys, I don't know if anyone saw the uh, footage of when China shut down and all the pollution went away, all right, because they weren't making things. Okay, that'll definitely tell you something. Okay. Uh, discrimination against immigrants, right? America's superior. We don't want more people coming in. And uh, other things you might be able to think of, okay? Um, and it's not just countries that have egocentrism either. It is the tendency to view uh, one's own race or culture as central and to diminish the importance or values of other races and cultures. You see this a lot with appropriation. And I don't remember if I covered this in class where um, Forever 21 was sued because they went out and they were using uh, the Navajo type of designs and putting it on shirts and literally calling it Navajo or this or that. Um, what was happening there is they were diminishing the value of what those designs actually meant for that culture. And instead of going, oh, it's pretty, I'm going to put on a shirt and sell it for 10 bucks. Right, so that's devaluing the actual importance of what those designs actually mean. And this happens all the time where a dominant culture or a dominant race ends up taking from a less dominant culture and race and either making money off of it or just diminishing the value of that race or culture. So yeah, ethnocentrism is not good, okay? Uh, what are some instances of ethnocentrism you may have seen in addition to the belief that the U.S. is the best? best country. I just talked about appropriation. That's a huge one that happens very often. They're doing better about it, I'm noticing, um, but it's still it's still very much out there. Uh, belief that one's own religion is superior is a huge one. And this is a scary thing because what happens when you have a religion that thinks it is superior, it results in a lot of issues. One of which is 
persecution of those who believe differently. All right. I don't know if any of you have ever been ostracized from a religion um, or, you know, grew up in a family of religion and you didn't unfortunately follow what your religion said and then lost family and friends. Like, this is a tough one. Okay. Um, also, religion discriminates against those of other races. Okay. Not all religions, but a lot of times when a religion believes in its superiority, it focuses on that. Okay. Uh, subjection. Uh, subjugation of women. A lot of times religions uh, will just kind of like, oh, you're a woman. You kind of, you got to go back down here. Mm -hmm. That's where you go. Um, and then there's also slavery. Okay. I'm not pointing at a religion per se, so don't freak out on me on that one. This is just when, you know, one's own religion, when you, when you use that, that ethnocentrism and you just kind of go, oh, mine's better than yours. This is when these, these issues start to pop up. Uh, belief that one state is better than uh, other states. So I'll be honest, I'm totally partial to California. I think it is progressive and I think that is beneficial to very many people of races and creeds and, you know, sexuality. And I love that. I like the openness of it. Um, so for that, I am partial to say California might be better than maybe other states. I'm not going to name any states because I don't know enough about other states to say we're better than them. I just know I'm partial. <laughs> okay. Um, but because of that, that now I get that, you know, that ethnocentrism type of mindset about my state being a better state. So I got to be careful. Um, is it possible that my reality assumption, my reality assumption about California is correct? Okay, and even if it is correct, the question is, is there danger involved with that thinking, right? So then I could start feeling superior to other people from other states and the way my attitudes might be and the way they might vote or live, right? See how that starts to get into dangerous territory. All right, what is the problem with ethnocentrism? I'm struggling on that word, y'all know me. I struggle with words, it's annoying. All right, so ethnocentrism, what's the problem with it? Fair decisions can't be made if you think you're superior. That's just the truth. You cannot make a fair decision if you think you're superior. Weird how that works, right? That's, that's, the, that's the point. That's why it's not good. Um, Fair-mindedness, we talked about just a second ago. Fair-mindedness is a trait used by critical thinkers that involves the respect of others, the willingness to be heard and to understand different viewpoints on an issue, right? You're willing to be understood and understand others and an openness to change when new information warrants it. This is kind of tough. We'll talk about it a little bit later about when we hear things that we, that it goes against what we thought we believed. Okay. All right. So to be fair minded, you have to be respectful, willing, and open. That's the biggest thing. Okay. And do you know anyone who is fair minded? Is there someone that you can talk to that, you know, no matter which say and throw out there, they'll go, Hmm. All right. You know, and willing and understanding and respectful. They might not necessarily agree, but they're willing to listen and be open-minded to it and willing to change if the right information was presented to them. Okay? Um, and do you admire these people and how do they act? Okay? When you have a conversation they don't agree with, especially, how do they act? Okay? In opposition, there are people who are egocentric. Okay? Egocentric. You've heard that before. Uh, egocentrism is the individual version of ethnocentrism, right? Ego, ethno, ego's you, ethno is bigger. This is a belief that everything revolves around the individual person. Their desires, their values, their beliefs and actions must always be considered correct and superior in order to preserve their ego. We all know someone like that, right? Yeah, we either see it, we hear it, we know it, okay? Um, so by the way, this is an extreme version of uh, uh, egotistic behavior, okay? So it's just an extreme version of it. Um, egotistic behavior is people who put themselves in the center of almost anything, and we all know egotistic people, okay? They tend to dominate, whether it's in a class, whether at their, you know, it's at family gatherings. We all know one, okay? All right, so when does uh, egotistic step over the line to egocentric? children who don't learn to share by a certain age okay when you're egotistic you're kind of self-centered you're in your own head and you become egocentric when you no longer you know at a certain age you're not sharing your toys anymore you can kind of see that in certain children uh, girls who steal each, uh, each other's boyfriends 
people who argue for their opinion regardless of facts or examples and won't listen. Okay, we know those people, we see it often. That's an egocentric type of person. Um, you think about those guys in Hollywood who they think that they can use women because they are full of power. Harvey Weinstein, we know plenty about him. If you don't, Google it and then I apologize for that in future. Um, the question might be, is he egocentric or is he just a sociopath? All right. And a lot of people will make an argument for either side. Um, so you can look that up and make your own decision. Uh, do you know anyone who is egocentric? Do you personally know anybody who's egocentric? Um, you know, who is that person? Take a minute, just for a minute, you can pause me if you need, and actually think like, who might that person be? Who could you think of it um, that you could actually look up and look at all those traits and go, oh, I actually know someone. You could be like, to yourself, you could be like, oh, it turns out it was me, you know, I don't know. You could just take a look and see how you feel. Pause me. Okay, now come back. All right, so now you get to decide here. Is the person you described just egotistic or are they over the line egocentric? Or are they a sociopath? Well, I don't know. Um, so President Trump, we do a question mark about that because a lot of people will throw that out there that he's a sociopath or that, uh, you know, he has very egocentric um, personality traits. And um, it's kind of unfortunately what we're seeing right now when he does his press conferences, you're either with me or you're out kind of thing. And it's very scary for a lot of the people in the ad, uh, administration that work with him. You kind of just have to agree with him. Okay. But the question might be also is maybe all presidents have to be egocentric, right? Someone who's like, I know what I'm talking about kind of thing, whether they're right or wrong, you know, maybe it's just someone, you know, maybe we need that or maybe we only elect someone with a powerful ego. And that's the thing that we need to start asking ourselves. Are we doing this to ourselves? You know, electing somebody based on that trait and what is the cause and what's it, what's it doing to or for us? Okay. Um, question for you are the following things egocentrism. So, I have known uh, people whose happiness seems strongly rooted in their sports team, okay, where uh, their team, if it wasn't winning, they would throw a huge fit, like things against the wall, TVs on the floor, that kind of thing, okay, is that egocentrism? Um, people who take it personally when uh, they would get a speeding ticket and they blame the cop for pulling them over even though they were speeding, which is why the cop pulled them over, all right, that blame game. Um, students who demand that I change, I've gotten this plenty of times, <laughs> demand that I change their grade from a D or an F or even a higher one because they, they earned, not because they earned it, sorry, not because they earned it, but because they needed a better grade. Well, if you needed a better grade, you had to do the work. Okay. Just a little, just a little tidbit out there, guys. All right. And then colleagues, you know, when you're at a meeting, colleagues who couldn't deal with a disagreement in a meeting and made it personal. So are these, are these behaviors egocentrism? All right, it's a good question to ask you. What do you think? Okay, in the cases of people who don't want, uh, won't wait in lines or refuse to take a feeling grade, I like to define, use the word arrogant, okay? And arrogant, my definition is someone who believes the rules don't apply to them. That's a very, right, when you hear arrogant, you're like, yep, sounds like someone who just doesn't believe the rules apply to them. Uh, examples include people who are recreational shoplifters. I see this often, very often. It's kind of annoying. There's like walk out the door. Okay. Uh, people who drive like assholes, you know, like you're driving and you're kind of going on fa 